Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Meet the Solutionaries on Green TV. Very delighted to bring someone onto the program, onto the channel, onto our platform, who I heard speak at uh, South by Southwest in Austin a couple of months ago. Michelle Lee uh, was on a panel talking about consumers and um, carbon footprints, and I, I knew I had to be there. And when I heard Michelle talking about what they're doing at Clever Carbon, I like the name, uh, I said, got to get her on, because this is exactly the kind of thing we need. We need to figure out how to quantify our, our carbon footprint. And that's really going to make a big difference, I think, in consumer awareness. And we're all consumers, of course, at what we consume, where we consume it, how we consume it, that can vary. And there are better ways to do it than than not. And that's what we're going to talk about. So welcome to Green TV. Great to have Thank you. Thank you so much. Clever Carbon. Happy to be I like the name. I, and I think what you're doing is so so necessary. So give us just a little bit of background about what made you decide to enter the climate space with this much needed piece of it. What I fundamentally understood is that we have a communications gap and an understanding gap in the impact of our decisions. So, you know, as an example, you know, a single use coffee cup or a flight today, you know, in the context of climate, people usually say, oh yeah, you know, that, that's bad, right? That, that, that's bad. Um, but, you know, we just don't have a way to objectively communicate or objectively understand what the actual impact is. So what if instead we were able to say, oh, you know, a single use coffee cup um, when manufactured is 16 grams of CO2 um, emitted and a flight that is an hour and 15 minutes is around 121 kilograms of CO2, right? Now we're not saying that if things are good or bad, we're being very objective. This is 16 grams, that is 121 kilograms. Um, an apple on average is 35 grams of CO2, potatoes 40 grams, a serving of chicken is 1300 grams, and a beef um, serving of beef is 7,700 grams, right? So these are numbers, these are data, this is facts, and that's that. <laughs> How do you figure that out? Is there a carbon calculator available? Yeah, so a lot of the information that I'm sharing here is publicly available information from different sites. So what I'm citing is from a BBC website. And, um, you know, we also have a carbon footprint calculator on our website where um, in two minutes you can find out your own personal carbon footprint because um, you know, when we use energy like electricity, for example, us being on the Zoom call, or we're charging our phone or we're turning on our lights, um, we use electricity or, you know, gas for a car. And, you know, today, majority of those emissions, um, well, using the fuel, burning fossil fuels creates greenhouse gases, and that means more CO2 in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. And so we actually have a personal carbon footprint as well. And typically, our personal carbon footprint is measured on an annual basis. So with our two minute carbon footprint quiz, you can find out what your own carbon footprint is and where your areas of opportunity are. Opportunity, I like that. Uh, we're learning really as a society um, that you know this really matters, our carbon footprint and output and that every little bit matters. And uh, as people wake up to smell the carbon, as I say, and realize we have to get off our gases, we have less than eight years to cut our emissions in half. And yet, you know, there's there's not a lot of eco literacy or or carbon literacy. Um, how can you know companies like yours really ramp up and get out there to show the masses that this is something a to be aware of and b to be responsible for once they have the proper tools? Yeah, you know, I I don't blame people or companies for not necessarily embracing this information because I think this is very new to a lot of people, if not, you know, something that they've never even heard of. Maybe people have heard of carbon footprint, but similar to myself, um, I thought carbon footprint was associated with countries, with factories. I did not know that I had a personal carbon footprint, and that's because I didn't know what carbon footprint really was. And, you know, who is really in a position to teach us about that information, right? Like, I don't think anyone has been really incentivized to teach us. And when I started learning about carbon footprint, I just found it very frustrating. Um, lots of like technical terms, ISO this, and, you know, just not friendly. And that's partly why I started Clever Carbon is because at the end of the day, what I learned is that carbon footprint is a number, you know, and the larger the number, the more carbon dioxide, which is not necessarily a good thing for the planet. And everyone knows numbers, right? So 
Um, I wanted to show people that in a really easy way. And, you know, I'm trying to make my way um, teaching people, teaching companies about carbon footprints. But, you know, even if you know that personally you have a carbon footprint, you may not know that your company actually has a carbon footprint too, or that, um, you know, cities have carbon footprints and everything. I think there's a learning process. And right now I'm trying to crack the nut in terms of how I can quickly scale that information because, you know, Betsy, even people who work in climate today, who speak on panels, talk about renewable energy, um, you know, talk about uh, climate and blockchain, they don't know their own carbon footprint. Uh, they don't know the carbon footprint of an apple or serving of chicken or, or beef. And I'm not saying that that's the be all end all, but I think that if more people had some form of carbon literacy, and if you know these people who are coming up with solutions are using a common language, you know, in the form of carbon uh, footprint to um, show why their solution makes sense then I think we would all be better off. We need to be more data-driven. We need to be black and white um, using data and facts. And of course, we also need to have a much cleaner, greener grid in this country because no matter how conscientious you are, it's still difficult, right? I mean, I'm very green and yet I had to fly here to the Bay Area last night um, where I'm from and doing some appointments and visiting and I feel guilty. I want to know how can I offset my carbon besides 25 years of reporting on the green beat and recycling and composting and driving hybrid cars and electric cars. I still feel guilty on that flight. Um, that doesn't do much good feeling guilty, but what about carbon offsets? If you really want to do the right thing and you know just how much damage you're causing, of course, I'm not the only one on the plane, but you know, it's just so hard to be green. Um, it's not easy as, as Kermit said, still not. Yeah. I mean, I think carbon offsets are interesting because, um, you know, carbon removal is 100% necessary. And I think I arrived to that conclusion maybe four months ago along my two-year climate journey. Mm -hmm. And if I can take a little, like, step back from that question, Betsy. So today in our atmosphere, um, the concentration of carbon dioxide is 418 parts per million. Just hit 420. Just hit 420. Just hit 420. Um, in 1900, it was 296 parts per million, right? That doesn't mean a lot. Um, but if I then said um, that experts say that when we pass 450 parts per million, that's where we're going to surpass 1.5 degrees Celsius, which means we're in a lot of trouble. And in order for us to have a stable climate, we should be below 350 parts per million. So this is the question around carbon offsets, right? Um, the question is, even if we didn't emit any carbon today, we would still be above 400, we would be above 350. So that's why carbon removal is absolutely essential. But what really kind of, you know, interests me is that, you know, there's very few people who understand carbon footprint, who know about carbon offsets, or will be motivated to buy a carbon offset. What really interests me is what is our supply and capacity for carbon removal and offset today? And why haven't we maximized that? You know, why are there still carbon credits available for purchase? Like, why haven't we collectively done as much as we can? That blows my mind. Are you talking about in developing technology that's not theoretical, but actually here now that we're using? Because there is so much, on the one hand, over-optimism in terms of people think, oh, technology will save us. And you hear about some potential inventions, but I think most people are not aware that they're, they haven't really worked to scale yet in the real world. And we shouldn't be overly hopeful that that's going to undo all the damage. Yeah. Uh, like, what I kind of mean is, if there is capacity for the earth and for technologies out there to absorb more carbon, why are we waiting for people to buy it? Why don't we just do it? <laughs> well, is it doable? I mean, do we have the ability to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere now? I mean, today you can go buy an offset for your flight. So there is capacity, there is supply. Why haven't we exhausted that supply? Hmm. Why haven't we? What do you think? I So this is my thoughts on offsetting, right? Like. My carbon footprint, let's say, for example, 17 and a half tons, that's the average in the US. Um, if I just offset 17 and a half, like, why don't I offset double that? You know, like, why, do, why don't I remove more than what I've emitted? Because that is what we need to actually be below 350 parts per million. 
which is the supposed safe level, 350, and we're 420, is it any wonder we're seeing extreme weather, really scary scenarios, biblical storms mm -hmm. and fires? It's it's so scary what, what's happening more rapidly than scientists had predicted. Um, I remember you reminded me, one of the um, statistics you gave it in that uh, South by Southwest panel was our carbon footprint in the United States, you know, superpower, United States, super wasters, super energy users, resource users, uh, compared to other countries. Give us a few examples to show just how heavy a carb load we have on the planet and how much we need to go on a low carb diet. Yeah, that's a great question, Betsy. So in the UK, the average annual carbon footprint of an individual is 8.3 tons of CO2 annually. In Vietnam, it's 2.1 tons, right? And just for reference, a flight from New York to Tokyo one way is 1.8 tons. So in one flight, someone can emit as much carbon as a single person in Vietnam, almost. And then in the US, it's 17 and a half tons. So yes, you know, the US is higher. Um, countries like Canada, Australia are quite similar. They're in the 16, 17 range. Um, countries in Europe are significantly lower. So usually in the, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 range. And it's very complex why that is. Um, it's access to renewable and clean energy for that particular country. It's the availability of public, uh, you know, transportation infrastructure in Europe. You can take a train to um, almost anywhere in, in Europe and in the US it's not really, you know, we don't have that infrastructure set up. Uh, sometimes it's dietary preferences as well. So it's very complicated, but inherently, you know, the country that you live in really does impact uh, your carbon footprint. And obviously cities on average have a much higher carbon footprint than people living in more rural areas. And yet, I, I think I heard maybe a uh, maybe about a decade ago that Manhattan had one of the lowest carbon footprints because you know there's dense population and a lot of people walk or take the subway and they don't have big yards, you know, and lawns and all that. So that's kind of a paradox. Yeah, I think Manhattan is interesting. So you know, city of New York, I think on average um, the carbon footprint is around 17. And while on the public transportation um, side of things, you know, there's a subway system, a bus system, city bikes, um, you know, really great things. Um, the access to renewable energy is one of the um, challenges of the city. There's no, there's not enough infrastructure to bring in clean energy in, in the city. There's, um, you know, no space to put solar panels or to, you know, have wind, et cetera. So that's, I think, a nut that the city is trying to chargers yeah. for electric vehicles. I haven't seen any around. I'm sure they're mm -hmm. there, but they're not obvious. Um, well, we have such big challenges ahead of us. What gives you optimism? I think that what gives me optimism is that people are genuinely interested in learning. You know, I think previously it was like, you know, our planet is, uh, you know, we're, we're, there's extreme weather and, you know, things are getting hard, but, you know, what can we do? But I think today more and more solutions are coming up. And, you know, in my friend group, at least people are open to learning. And, you know, my friends tell me, oh, you know, I, I started eating less meat and I, you know, did this switch because I learned that. And I think if, you know, people are willing to do, um, you know, to be inconvenienced if they know the impact that will bring. And especially, you know, we're talking about beef that's 7,700 grams and chicken's 1,300 grams and, you know, vegetarian meal is around 600 to 700 grams. Like hopefully once that becomes common knowledge, um, you know, people will, uh, you know, eat more of a plant-based diet. And you, you know, you see that popping up everywhere, right? Like, Chipotle has plant-based options, you know, just salads doing a great job. Um, and more companies are using sustainable, um, sustainable, you know, recyclable, responsible in their marketing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is definitely talk of greenwashing and whatnot, but I think what that signals is that companies, brands, people know this is important. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the first step. The second step is just making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what sustainable actually means. And we'll do those things because we actually want to be sustainable. Um, I'm, you know, highly optimistic that, you know, we're all gonna try, try our best. And consumer awareness and what you're doing to provide feedback is so critical. It has to start with us. And yet 
it's not a secret that we need systemic change because the whole system really our economy our energy system our food supply system really everything needs to change and and by the way in the background of all of us trying to be good green citizens you know you've got the oil companies getting subsidized and making record profits you know during this whole ukraine crisis and it, it almost it's very it's very discouraging and defeating really because like what difference can i make even as we're waking up to realize yes we can make a difference but it's so tiny and even if we all did the right thing, there's still we've got to have such some major changes in the our whole you know globalization of the planet and 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 how do you um, incorporate that into your optimism? I mean, it is definitely challenging, um, but I think because I focus on one specific thing, which I think is fundamentally important, um, you know, the war in Ukraine. Um, doesn't impact my ability to spread carbon literacy. And so, you know, I will try day in, day out to get as many people to take the quiz. And, you know, it, it is challenging. And I, you know, for so many reasons, and, and you know, that's why, for example, the, the UN SDG framework is so important as well, because it's not only climate action that matters, it's, you know, no poverty, it's peace and prosperity, it's quality education. And I think, you know, all of those things are so important. And right now, uh, you know, fundamentally, peace and prosperity is, is um, you know, not something that we can say that we've achieved. But, you know, if I stop, if I'm not optimistic, then the work is not going to be done. And uh, I don't kind of let myself get too down. And I just keep going. So what would you like to encourage our viewers to do, whether they're just beginning down the road of eco enlightenment and, and want to know everything they can do? Uh, as an individual, or they're deeper into it and want to take it to the next step? I think it's all about um, using data and facts and being objective. You know, um, renewables are better because, uh, you know, the embodied carbon of manufacturing a solar panel is X, and over 10 years, it's going to reduce emissions by Y. Um, you know, I think this data is so important, and also just understanding, like, you know, what is our energy usage now? Like, you know, are we retrofitting a system that is not optimizing efficiently? You know, for example, we use a lot of energy, we waste a lot of energy, right? How can, you know, today, how can everybody do little small steps to actually reduce our energy? And so, you know, whatever targets we um, set in the future will more easily meet them because we're not wasting energy. And also being open to different models so for example, today, you know, we have a very big model around individual ownership, right? I own my car, I own my Vitamix, I own my lawnmower. But, you know, what if we shared a lawnmower on a block, right? Like, does everyone really need their own lawnmower? Or, you know, I live in an apartment, you know, it, I don't use my Vitamix every day. You know, other people could borrow it and share it and it would actually be used more. And, you know, for example, electric vehicles, I think there's a lot of excitement about them. But, you know, I don't think the answer to climate change is everyone switching over to an EV vehicle. Um, I would love for cities to be really imaginative. Like, what if the city owned the vehicles? What would that look like? You know, what if a private company owned a group of vehicles that were then shared among everyone? They would be used more often. But then, you know, if we think about the manufacturing process, instead of, you know, a red car with a sunroof, you know, maybe they're all black cars and, you know, they all have the same models. And from a manufacturing standpoint, that's so much easier to manufacture, right? Like, I think considering different models, and I recently heard, uh, you know, appliances, for example, having some sort of subscription model. So instead of buying your washing machine or your dishwasher, um, you pay a monthly rate to own it, but then that means the manufacturer has every incentive to extend the lifetime of that appliance in order to maximize their profits, right? So just rethinking the way we um, own what we have and, and maybe um, being open to not needing to own everything, I think is really interesting. Sharing economy, which we've certainly seen with Airbnb and Uber, and what you're talking about, like the sharing of lawnmowers, you know, leaf blowers, which are not green at all, but there are lawns for that matter. And I, I know what you're talking about, and I, I agree with it because 
we have too much stuff. Look at, you just gave the carbon footprint of the United States compared to the rest of the world. And a lot of it is about our stuff and our, our habits flying around all the time and big houses, big mm -hmm. you know yards and all that energy and water mm -hmm. that it takes to keep them going. But, but what would you say to people who say, well, that's going to kill the economy if you've got people sharing a lawnmower and not going out and buying one. We can't do, we can't possibly do that. Of course, there's no good economy on a dead planet, but <laughs> Yeah. Somewhere there, somewhere I mean, in there, some midpoint that I think we should strive for. I think it's, you know, renewables means we're killing the oil and gas companies. So, you know, we, I don't think anyone really has any issues on that. Um, but yeah, you know, like I'm sure there used to be lots of people who owned horses because that was the mode of transportation and we don't have that anymore. You know, we will find a way to transition if we want a planet to live on. If we want a planet to live on, that is key. And and we'll we'll close on an optimistic note. But let me just ask you kind of a maybe a negative question. It, it does it frustrate you when you kind of go out in the world, like get outside my bubble, and I just think, how are we going to reach all these people? You know, walking down the streets in Manhattan and oblivious, seemingly, and you know, kind of working their way up the ladder, trying to acquire more and the American dream. I get like, oh my gosh, who am I kidding? Like, the, how are we going to reach all these people in time? How do you deal with that kind of cognitive dissonance of living in the sort of green climate bubble with people who get it and are working towards it, which is so inspiring and empowering and we need to connect. And then sort of realizing that we're still kind of on the margins of consciousness in terms of American society anyway. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good question or a good answer to that, Betsy, but I, you know, my assumption that is that, you know, most people don't know about their carbon footprint, they don't understand, um, you know, the climate challenge we're facing today, and that's why they're still continuing to do what they do. Now, if they know and continue to do the same, then that's a little bit of a different story. But you know, at the end of the day, everyone gets to make their own decisions, and you know, my job is to educate and to use data and facts to help people make better decisions, and you know, hopefully that will generate market trends that will make you know more sustainable options available and we'll have more bright minds think together and solve the problem together and maybe that won't be a thing in the future Betsy. And I think there's also something about you know leading by example when you see your neighbor put solar panels on you tend to inquire or your neighbor down the street has an electric car that's happened to us living in Texas and you know we'd like to think mm -hmm. we're part of the greening of the red state and blueing yeah um, and and so that, that their peer pressure or just the, the suggestion you know social suggestions research shows that really does make a difference and I know what you mean because if everybody knew what we knew and they were doing so little I think I just completely to be depressed and give up. But it's the hope that if we could just connect the dots and really get this out there, because once people know, especially if they're parents or grandparents, how can you just continue on as if you don't know? So that, that's where I get my hope. And that's what's kept me doing solutions oriented green media for a couple of decades. And, and we have a big job to do and we don't have a lot of time. So I really thank you, Michelle Lee, for what you're doing with your efforts and Clever Carbon. And it's really encouraging and inspiring. And I hope you get out there and, and expand really. I'll, we'll do our part to let people know. And thank you for being part of Green TV. This is our Meet the Solutionary series and you are the embodiment of a, a really important aspect of this effort to uh, make ourselves sustainable. It really, and maybe even thrive, you know, because as William McDonough mm -hmm. said, when I interviewed him two decades ago, well, who wants to have a sustainable marriage? We need to thrive, but we're kind of going in the wrong direction, but that is the promise, right, of tomorrow, but we got to start today. So thanks for being with us. And we'll um, put a link up to your website. Uh, you want to just give it out so we can uh, tell people where to go if they want to do a little quiz or find out what they can do. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. It's clevercarbon.io slash quiz to take the two minute quiz. We are also very active on Instagram and LinkedIn. So please give us a follow. Absolutely, will do. And I want to thank our editor, Christine Weiss, for making all these uh, interviews a little bit cleaner and uh, also our whole team. We have a group of nine very dedicated volunteers at greentv.com and we're hoping to grow our audience. Uh, we're trying to get up to about a thousand subscribers. So if you and everyone watching can just go to the YouTube channel for Green TV, subscribe. There's no cost. We will not send you any spam. Au contraire, we'll send you links to people like Michelle Lee and uh, tell your friends about it too, because we gave up on the um, mainstream news outlets, or I did, you know, really focusing on solutions in a meaningful way. And that's what Green TV is about, trying to fill that gap in news. And we just 
want to do exactly what you say is needed is get the word out so people can at least be informed. And uh, that's, that's no small thing. So thanks for your part again, and we'll see you next time.